Good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's session with Education USA in Libya. This is Amira, the Education USA advisor for Libya, and I'm so glad to have with us Patrick, the associate director at the University of South Dakota. Hi, Patrick. Hello, Amira, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Yes, happy to be here. Thank you so much. So I hope you will uh, benefit a lot from today's session, everyone. So if you are following us, you will get the chance to explore different health science programs, including dental hygiene, nursing, public health, uh, medical lab science, mental health, kinesiology, and nutrition, nutrition studies. So you will also learn more about the funding options, the eligibility requirements, and the coursework of each program. So stay tuned, take notes, prepare your questions, and share the video with anyone who's interested in these majors, of course. Okay, so before we kick it off with Patrick, I'm going to start with a brief introduction about Education USA, because we always have new followers and new students who are interested in studying in the US. So who we are and how can we help you? So Education USA, as you can see here, it is a US Department of State network. This means that we are your official source on US higher education. Our network promotes US higher education to students around the world. So many students seek advice uh, from a regional Education USA advisor before, during, and after the application process. That's why there are around 430 advising centers located in more than 170 countries. So the good thing about about us is that we offer free, accurate, comprehensive, and current information about everything you need to know um, to study uh, at universities in the United States. So moving on to the next slide, what are the benefits and how can we help you? So there are actually a lot of benefits for international students. So number one, we offer free public info sessions about many topics related to US studies. Example, five steps to study in the US, sessions on personal statement and essay writing that like we did um, last week, sessions on the visa process, session on new opportunities for students like the Fulbright program, the DKSSF scholarship, the CCC, etc. Um, so just make sure to follow us on social media and check our events on Facebook. Number two, we host you as college representatives and hold sessions about specific majors like today's session and sometimes uh, sessions about financial aid and scholarship opportunities, uh, sessions about the US culture, and we sometimes host uh, Libyan alumni who study in the US to share their experiences and chat with you. Number three, we offer uh, a wide range of virtual services to students and their parents. So if anyone has specific questions or needs guidance with the application or any related topic, please email me or text me. Now, um, good news, breaking news for Education USA Libya. Uh, this is one of the new services that we offer. It is writing feedback and review. So if you need me to proofread your personal statement, your essay, your CV before applying to a US university or college, you are able to sign up for a 30 minute session with me every Friday. Now, before turning it over to our um, guests, so he, he, this, these are my contact information. So feel free to contact me on WhatsApp or uh, this is my official email. And you can find us on Facebook and Instagram. And this is our official website, educationusa.state.gov, if you'd like to get more insights about uh, the five steps to study in the US or different financial aid opportunities. Now, I'm gonna turn it over to Patrick Morrison. Prepare your questions. Please share the video with anyone who's interested in these fields. And at the end of the session, you will get the chance to get your questions answered. All right, thank you everyone for joining us today. So it'd be your afternoon, my morning, but um, not terribly early morning, like a lot of them have, a lot of these presentations have been. So, um, so today I'm gonna just step through, um, as Amina said, a couple of the larger health science um, fields of study within the United States. But before I get to that, I really wanna define what health science is. Um, so first that this is, health science represents a large group of disciplines related to the delivery of healthcare. 
So it's different from medicine in the sense of medicine studying, you know, the human body. How do we make, you know, a sick person better, right? Or understanding why a person gets sick, right? So um, health science is a little more of, okay, we have this concept of medicine, this concept of health, but how do we get that health care to people? Um, you know, what are other types of preventative measures that we can take um, as opposed to just, okay, you're sick, you go to the doctor, right? It's thinking of the whole business and the science around health and wellness. So it's definitely science-based. Um, so it's a science-based study of health problems and then the outcomes. Um, but it's also an interdisciplinary focus, right? So it's not just, again, medicine. You go to the doctor, we understand anatomy and physiology, and this is what, why you got sick. It also goes into what factors got that illness, right? So think of we're in the COVID-19 era. Um, think of, okay, the public health measures. Like, well, are you in a crowded area without a mask, right? Or are you, um, you know, living in a, um, a building that's not well ventilated and maybe that helps, you know, cause an issue. Maybe your diet and exercise is not there. So you're more susceptible to a particular illness. So, um, so it's really includes the study both the natural sciences. So your anatomy, physiology, but also behavioral sciences, so psychology, and then nutrition and public health. So really these are increasing in the United States, especially the whole field of medicine and health sciences in general in the US is rapidly growing. It's anywhere from 10 to 15% um, growth year over year, depending on the field. Um, it's one of the largest industries in the United States. If we think of like as a um, the service industry, right? If we think of that whole part of the US economy, very much a big piece of that um, economy in the United States is rapidly growing. And so increasingly, the study of health sciences and the things we're going to talk about are viewed really as an alternative to medical school. So none of these programs lead naturally directly into the study of medicine, right? So the reason why these are becoming more important is in some ways they're less competitive than medicine, right? Um, so, you know, anywhere from one to 3% of students in the United States that start off, international students that start off thinking of, I'm going to go to medical school, only about one to 3% will end up getting into medical school. And then amongst Americans, it's typically five to 6%. So we're talking single digits. So it's definitely less competitive, less time consuming. Um, so to be a medical doctor in the United States, you have to do a four year bachelor's degree. And then that's another um, three and a half to four years of education, plus your residency and um, internships and things like that. So it's anywhere from an eight to 10 year process to be a fully fledged medical doctor. And they're also less expensive, right? Um, medical school itself is quite an expensive endeavor. Of course, doctors make a lot of money, but they, you know, um, it's still, you have to have that money to put into it first and then you make it back over time. So if you have that money set aside, great. If you don't, it, you know, it can be a challenge. And then lastly, health sciences are much more adaptable and flexible compared to other science and clinical programs. So, um, you know, you can really go with a, let's say, a degree in nutrition. You can go to a lot of different um, master's degrees or PhDs or different career areas, as we'll see in a minute. Whereas if you're studying, you know, um, you know, a strict like science, like, you know, biochemistry, you know, there's a little bit, can be a little bit narrower pathway. Um, you want to be a doctor, really, there's only one way to be a doctor in the United States, and that's medical school. Whereas if you just want to work in health science, or I want to work in the medicine field broadly defined, health science careers give you a lot more options to still be involved in that area without um, having only one option. So uh, popular fields of health science study are all listed here. So you can see there's almost like a little over 10, and these aren't all of them, these are kind of the, the main ones. So again, you can think of, you know, they kind of run the, um, run the range from addiction studies Right, so helping people with drug and alcohol um, issues to health services administration, which is you know the business of running a hospital. So you know staffing and the finance piece of it to um, occupational therapy. So helping somebody that has had um, maybe a stroke or um, it was in a car accident. So it's not so much the getting them back to like physical therapy or getting them back, you know, helping them recover from an injury. It's helping them adapt to their new. Um, lifestyle or new um, new way of life after that injury. Um, and then of course, public health is a big one. So they really do run the area from more, very much more um, 
medicine focused careers to also public policy to business um, and then some that are more focused on the sciences. So I'm going to focus on about five or six individual fields of study here today. Um, and uh, so feel free to ask specific questions, you know, in the chat or otherwise on these. And then if at the end of the presentation you have a question on maybe a field that we didn't cover, you know, I'm happy to try and answer those questions as well. So the first one I'm going to talk about today is dental hygiene. So um, dental hygiene really is focusing on preventative oral health care of individual patients. So this can include things like your teeth cleaning, gum examinations, x-rays, and then educating people about oral health care. So in the United States, this is a pretty lucrative profession. Um, dental hygienists um, often are the, you know, as a dentist really only are, they kind of come in, you go to a, you know, I just went to the dentist earlier. So you go into the dentist, most of your time, all but let's say of your hour appointment, 50 minutes is spent with the dental hygienist. So he or she is kind of on the front line of, you know, cleaning the teeth, doing the x-rays, but then also kind of doing the preliminary um, investig investigation work really to see, is there any issues with your teeth? What needs to be fixed? And then the dentist comes in, looks at the x-rays, does a quick exam. And then if a cavity needs to be filled or to do a root canal, then the dentist takes over. But, um, you know, every year you're supposed to, in the U.S., they say two dental exams. Um, you know, one of those two times is just with a dental hygienist. And then if he or she feels that they need to escalate that um, to the dentist, they would. So this is very much a frontline medical worker type job. Um, they're, they're paid very well, as we'll talk about in a minute, but they're very much a respected career here in the United States. So coursework, um, typically you do two, uh, two years at the bachelor's level um, of prerequisite study. So you're gonna take classes like um, anatomy and physiology, microbiology, and these other sort of foundational courses. Um, and then you do two years of intense study and practicum. So, um, your, your final two years will be on classes like dental anatomy, radiology, periodontology, um, and then pharmacology and nutrition classes as specific to kind of the, the, the mouth and, you know, all that sort of thing. Um, and then you have practicum. So you're going to work through all of these things under the supervision of faculty. So you can see here we have, you know, a dental hygiene student on the top photo here at the University of South Dakota. Um, she's showing um, an individual, this is how you properly brush your teeth with it. You're doing the oral education piece. And then below it, she's doing a teeth cleaning um, with under the supervision of that faculty member, right? And so they're going to see patients all throughout this. So when you graduate, you're going to have a lot of practical experience already. So it's built into the program. Um, and then usually you would go to, um, you, know, you would have board exams that you would sit for. Um, pretty much every dental hygiene program in the United States is going to have that built into the curriculum. So, you know, you finish, get with your bachelor's degree, sit for your board exams, and then you're able to go out into the workforce as a fully fledged um, licensed dental hygienist. So job demand is expected to grow about 6% um, year over year by 2029. And then the median pay is $76,000 per year. So when I said they get paid quite well, that's a you know, very generous salary in the United States. So, and that's median, obviously some people are gonna be making less, some people are making more, but that's still a pretty generous salary. And then lastly, if you're looking to thinking of maybe you wanna do postgraduate work um, in this field after your bachelor's degree, um, certainly there are master's level studies in the field. Usually, um, you know, that's focused if you wanna go more into education, you wanna go into public health, you might get a master's of public health, or perhaps you want to be a faculty member, um, go into the you know, um, you know, education, you would get a master's degree, but it's really not required to be a dental hygienist. And it really won't bring a lot of value if you're seeing patients. So the next area I would like to talk about um, is kinesiology and sport management. Uh, this is a field of study that really in the last, like when I went to college 10 years ago, I don't really think it was a thing. I mean, it might've been, but it's really grown um, as we start to understand um, the science behind exercise um, and uh, what wellness can you know, exercise and wellness. Now that's an important, increasingly important part of, um, you know, to keep people healthy. And then also just the sport management piece of just the industry of sports, right? There's a lot more, you know, think of all the you know, professional sporting leagues in the United States and the college athletics that we have um, all the way through down to recreation, golf, tennis, those sorts of clubs that operate. So uh, KSM is, for short, the acronym KSM um, is the 
exercise assessment, prescription and programming for athletes, and then the general population. So really it's focusing on, um, so that's kind of the exercise science kinesiology piece. And then the sport management piece works on the business of athletics, sport entertainment and exercise. So, you know, running a, um, you know, working in, um, you know, um, let's say the Premier League, right, in the UK, right? There's probably plenty of people that understand how to manage sports and the business side behind that and advertising, you know, all these sorts of principles that have existed previously in the business world, but now they have that extra layer specifically to sports. Um, so coursework for the, um, you know, for this degree, you know, nutrition is obviously very important, right? We're working with athletes, what we put into their, what we put into our bodies, obviously is, there's some good things um, for uh, to be a good athlete and others not, right? So if you're eating McDonald's every day and you wanna play in the, you know, Premier League, not a probably good idea, right? Um, exercise physiology, biomechanics, and then rehabilitation, right? So if you get an injury, how are we getting you back from that in the sports context? And then marketing, right? The marketing might seem odd, but again, when we're thinking about the business of sport, right? Of sports, that's um, gonna be a big piece of that. So this is an area where job demand has really been growing quickly um, and expected growth of 27% um, by 2024, so from 2014 numbers. Um, largely because, again, this is a very rapidly growing industry in the United States and sports are a big part of the culture as well in the United States. So as far as uh, what you can do postgraduate work, um, you can definitely do uh, master's and doctoral uh, programs in the field. Um, so there definitely are exercise science degrees. Also, this is a, a nice degree if you're thinking of going into physical therapy or occupational therapy programs at the graduate level especially the exercise science piece. So if you're doing kinesiology, right, it's the body mechanics and um, physiology and those sorts of things that naturally would lead into physical therapy and occupational therapy. So the next area is medical laboratory science. So medical laboratory science is working with um, and supervising pathologists, medical lab technicians, and other lab specialists in a clinical setting or in a hospital. So, um, or perhaps in a government lab. Um, so these are the types of individuals, right? So if you think you go to the doctor and, um, you know, I, you know, have really tired all the time and I think, well, let's take a blood test, right? So the nurse takes the blood test, that goes off to the medical lab and the medical laboratory science folks, they're the ones that are taking that, running all the tests in the lab and the, and the clinic or the hospital to really diagnose what is wrong. And then they give the run out, get all these results and provide them back to, you know, your doctor or your nurse who will sort of interpret that results and then help diagnose what the issue is and help you get better. So these really are uh, medical laboratory scientists really have a key role, right, in, in providing medicine uh, or, you know, in the medical field. Um, so these programs, typically you graduate um, with your for your degree in medical laboratory science. And then you're eligible for a national certification against some tests. And then you are a nationally certified medical laboratory scientist or technician. Um, so if typically if you're getting a bachelor's degree in this, um, you are more likely on a pathway to be a manager or a supervisor of the lab and really kind of overseeing the technicians themselves. Um, whereas there are other degrees that could be a two year degree where you're more of just focusing on your lab tech as opposed to the supervisor of the lab. So as you can imagine, the coursework can be pretty varied, but very focused on some really specific science areas. So hematology, so blood work, really understanding, you know, the whole human blood system, right, and how all of that works and how we're running tests and what systems we're using for that. Uh, clinical chemistry and microbiology, you know, immunology, right, how does the body fight infections? And like, you know, so think of COVID-19, right, there's, you know, without a medical laboratory science scientists, where would we be, right? Um, um, and parasitology, so thinking like, okay, what does somebody have, um, you know, a parasite somewhere in their body, is that, you know, getting you sick or not? So you're really learning both the science of all these areas, and then you're going into the actual labs on our campus, and then through a year-long clinical rotation of putting what you're learning into practice. And so this is pretty common through all of these degrees throughout the United States, where you basically have three years of study, really understanding the science, doing some stuff on campus, and then you're doing going out in the workforce for an entire year, putting this into practice. So when you graduate, not only will you have a national certification, but you'll have a year of um, experience and in, in the field under your um, belts that when you go out in the workforce, 
you already have that. So you're not having to like do a four year degree and like I have no practical experience. You're already, already going to have that built in. Um, as you can expect, job demand, um, you know, expected to grow. And I think over recent events of last year or two, I think we'll even see faster growth in this. So um, predicted to grow by about 14% by 2026 in the United States. Um, and then of course there are opportunities for postgraduate study. So, you know, specifically think biomedical engineering or basic biomedical sciences. So this is could be a unique degree that, you know, you can study biomedical engineering or basic biomedical sciences as a degree but on your own in the bachelor's. But other than some research, it's a lot more theoretical knowledge. And so when you graduate, you don't really have like, well, what can I do with it? Well, you can go find a degree perhaps, or go find a job perhaps in, um, you know, in a um, biomedical engineering company or something like that. But more likely than not, you're looking at postgraduate study. So with a medical laboratory science degree, you could have not only a, a job skill and a skill set that you could get a job right away in that field. If you're perhaps interested in going into biomedical engineering, um, that might be an interesting career choice, right? Because you already have a knowledge of all of this lab equipment and how it works. So if you were to go get a degree um, to design more lab equipment or better diagnostic tools, those sorts of things, um, you know, this could be a very interesting career path, if, you know, when you get to that point. Um, so it does give you a lot of options within this area. Um, next, we have um, mental health counseling. So um, as you can imagine, this is a pretty broad area. Um, so I'm going to kind of focus on what you can do with kind of a bachelor's or master's degree. But of course, there's you know, clinical psychologists and others that are PhD study, um, psychiatrists, but you have to typically go to medical school for that. So we're focusing on what you can do with a bachelor's and or master's degree in this area. So mental health counseling provides services um, in quite, as I said, a variety of areas. So this can be addiction, right? So folks with perhaps alcohol, drug, or other addictive personalities, um, mental health counseling, so just in general mental health, and then also behavioral problems, right? So think of maybe more um, elementary to middle school, high school individuals that have um, behavioral issues in school and classes, and so you're working with the youth, you know, youth in a, maybe a, um, you're a school counselor and you're working um, with students in that area. So usually um, for these areas, you do need some sort of postgraduate degree in licensure. Um, that is usually um, achieved by obtaining a master's or PhD in the relevant area. Um, so some ex ex exemptions that like addiction studies, right? Um, you can usually do that with a bachelor's degree, um, but there's also a master's degrees available in that. Um, certainly if you wanna be a clinical psychologist, you typically need a PhD in that area. Um, but school counseling, um, behavioral um, counseling, things like that, typically a master's degree in that area would um, be sufficient for that. So typically first you're going to obtain a degree in a preparatory field for these postgraduate study areas. So those would typically going to be these four here. So psychology would be by far the most common. And then neuroscience, if you're thinking, um, so that's gonna be a lot more science heavy, but covers a lot of the same topics as psychology. Um, addiction studies, again, if you're looking to go into that area. And then sociology, um, it's a little bit, a little less common, but if you add some psychology classes into that, um, you know, it would be a natural sort of fit there. Um, so coursework that you're going to take at the bachelor's level, um, you're gonna do a lot of human development work, right? So how to, you know, from, what sort of issues can we spot as humans are developing? And like what actions might cause future um, trauma or what how do individuals deal with different trauma? Um, disaster psychology. So that's something that we have at our university that, um, you know, for example, um, when the, um, in 2011, um, when the tsunami hit Japan and caused a lot of devastation, our um, some of our faculty members and graduate students went to Japan and worked with the Japanese Red Cross to help individuals that are experiencing um, the trauma from natural disasters and other things. So um, there's definitely, you can choose to specialize in that in the United States and through, uh, through certain programs. Um, toxicology, so that's more kind of addiction studies, but also just in general, understanding how, you know, what, if you, you know, what substances impact, how do substances impact people um, and their behavior and mental health. Industrial psychology. So this is, you know, if you're thinking more of maybe you want to study human relations or human um, HR, right, in a business setting. 
Some students will also add psychology in there because they want to understand how does a business work, right? How do companies, um, you know, structure a workplace or incentives in a company to make workers more productive, but also happier and more cohesive. Um, there's also organizational behavior classes that are very similar to that. Um, and then, of course, you're going to take classes in individual and group counseling. Um, so, you know, how do I actually interact with um, my patients and how do I, um, how does that process work if I'm doing a group counseling, you know, and a lot of um, understanding best practices there. Um, again, we can see here, this is probably one of the fields that's growing the most rapidly within health sciences. It was growth by 25% by 2020. Um, this is largely due to there's a lot more emphasis in the United States now um, placed on emotional well-being and mental health. Um, so employers are really investing in this area, um, insurance companies, and just individuals are really um, wanting more um, care in this area. So it's definitely a growing field in the United States and probably one of the most rapidly growing out of all the health science careers. And then, of course, I already kind of talked about the graduate degrees that you go into, but there's a lot of opportunities at the master's and PhD level. Um, nursing, so this is probably of all the health sciences, probably the largest as a percentage of um, students. Um, nurses, of course, are well known. Everybody knows kind of what a nurse does. But in the United States, especially um, given just the way our healthcare system is set up, um, you know, doctors, it's, as it, since it takes so long to be a doctor, doctors also, it's an expensive thing to go to a doctor. So increasingly, nurses are taking a lot of responsibility, um, you know, in seeing patients. So extensive patient care responsibilities. And I would say much more than the United States and other countries to be a nurse is a, it's very much a highly respected profession. They're compensated quite well. And a lot of people, um, you know, they spend more, again, kind of like a dental hygienist, they spend more time with the nurse than they would with the doctor um, doing all the different tests. Um, so graduates from a nursing, if you get a BSN, you're going to get a national certification typically through at the state level, but that's going to be then recognized all over the United States. So coursework, um, nutrition, microbiology, pharmacology, clinical practice, pathophysiology. So all the kind of things you would assume um, to be um, you know, covered for a nurse. Um, and, and like dental hygiene, you're typically going to take two years of prerequisite study, followed by two years of your intensive study and practicum. So again, first two years, your anatomy, physiology, microbiology, and then your final two years are really focused on nursing practice. You're going out into hospitals and clinics under the supervision of a faculty member, um, who, and they're going to be providing you with, um, you know, that that knowledge. And then you're also um, required internships where you're out in the job site under the supervision of that, um, practicing nurses. So this is definitely a field of study where when you graduate. You're not only going to have a bachelor's degree, you're not only going to have a national certification, but you're going to have at least two years of pretty robust practical and clinical experience. So it's really much a, you can hit the ground running um, and really be a, you know, a well-credentialed individual with good background, uh, good practical experience. You can see here um, job demand also growing a growth area by 12% by 2030. The median salary for nurses is $73,000. Um, so that's, you know, um, quite significant salary here in the US. So definitely would be on the blog opportunities there. I would also say nurses are incredibly um, high demand. So um, there are definitely um, programs available in, under the visa categories where that if you were to come and get a nursing degree, um, just there's a lot of stay back options here in the US. Um, and of course, you know, in like the Gulf states, you know, UAE, Qatar, Dubai, we've actually had students that have graduated from our nursing for international students graduated from those programs and then gone to those areas to work as nurses as well. And you certainly can get master's and doctoral degrees in nursing, um, and you could also then go into other medical fields, you know, um, with, with that as well. So um, nutrition and dietetics. So this one, um, this is really focusing on the, um, really the high tech science of applying food and nutrition to health outcomes and to prevent diseases. So these individuals generally work in either healthcare, wellness education, or food service operations. Um, you know, so think obviously, you know, maybe the you know dietitians also work in the hospital cafeteria and working as we're providing food to all of our patients. And like what, depending on the illness, what sort of food um, and nutrition should they be receiving? Um, and you know, at what stage they are, like in um, 
post-surgery, right? What can they be eating? What should they be eating? How does that work? Um, you know, wellness education, so going into schools and um, working for perhaps the government and educating individuals on healthy choices when it comes to food. And then also in food service operations themselves, right? So um, maybe it's school systems or um, perhaps they're, uh, you know, hotel chains are a little bit more into wellness, you know, so that they might have a, a nutritionist on staff. So um, coursework, you're going to do the anatomy, right? Which is pretty common for all of these, but also food principles and science, and then a lot of fields of nutrition. So really getting down into the, um, you know, getting down to the base level. So medical nutrition, which again, going in that more of that hospital clinical setting. Uh, community nutrition, so thinking more of kind of a public health. Molecular, right? Getting down to the basics of food science and understanding how does that provide energy and nutrition and more. So students do complete internships and then they um, sit for exams to become a registered dietitian nutritionist. So again, this is another field. This is kind of a common thread through all the health sciences. Um, there's a lot of focus on practicums, practical experience, and then you get a credential that's good all over the country. Another growth area, um, about an 8% growth by 2029. And then the current median salaries are about $61,000 per year. That can vary depending on where, what sort of fields within nutrition and dietetics you're looking at. Um, but um, you know, if you're working at, a, like for example, one of the gross, bigger grocery stores here, we'll have a registered um, dietitian on staff. And so you know, they work with the pharmacy. So if somebody who's recovering from an illness, they'll also meet with the dietitian to sort of prescribe that. And, um, but then if you're working in a hospital system overseeing sort of the nutrition fields there, to be more lucrative. And you definitely have opportunities in clinical research and industrial fields if you want to go on to um, postgraduate study if, if you feel it's some area you're interested in if you want to further specialize. And the last field I'm going to talk about here is public health. Um, so this is obviously a big field as we know, right? So I'm sure we all hear of all these um, folks with public health degrees and we hear about this now, especially in the COVID-19 era, but I think it just really enforces, reinforces the, um, I think going forward, a lot more emphasis is going to be placed on this um, area of public health. So public health focuses on the prevention and mitigation of diseases, as well as the health challenges that um, affect many people at once. So, and that includes things like pollution and malnutrition. So um, it's a little bit different, like public health, like some of the things we're seeing before, nursing, dental hygiene, mental health counseling, it kind of deals with one individual to another individual, right? You know, you're seeing, see, one dental hygienist is seeing one patient at a time. Public health, they work with, by definition, large groups of people. So it's kind of unique compared to these other fields that we're looking at. Um, so again, community health, um, both in community can be just a school, it could be 100, 200 kids in school, it could be the city of New York with 11 million people. Um, so a lot of coursework, biostatistics, so you have to really understand um, statistics and numbers. And if you know, one person gets COVID-19, how many other people and how what's the chain reaction there? epidemiology, um, health service administration. So again, how do hospitals and clinics function as a business and um, in a community, social and behavioral sciences, and then environmental health. So kind of going back to that pollution, um, you know, malnutrition, things like that. This is a pretty diverse area. There's a lot of areas to specialize within public health. So are you focusing more on the, you know, epidemiology side of things, right? So infectious diseases, is it more um, the environmental impacts of things like climate change or um, pollution? Is it more of community mental health? So depending on your area, you really could probably, you know, depending on your area of health science, you could still practice your passion, but perhaps your passion plus in seeing one person at a time and maybe you really wanna work on hope, helping a whole community together. Um, so job growth and median salaries do vary by practice field. Um, you know, So it, it's kind of hard to give a, a Kind of clear outlook on that. I would say um, we've had folks, you know, public health has been a robust career path for a long time. I don't see anything that would suggest it's not going to continue to grow and offer good opportunities for you, um, whether in the United States or around the world. And then uh, most students that would do a public health bachelor's degree, they're most likely at some point in their career going to get a master of public health. That's sort of the gold standard of um, you know, degrees. So if you really do want to advance in public health, you will at some point get a master of public health. And that's recognized all over the world, um, obviously, and, uh, you know, really provides a lot more um, leadership and 
kind of um, professional practice within that degree. And then just quickly, I'm just going to give just a little summation of USD, um, and then we can get to questions. Um, so we have just to stay on the health sciences, we have strong programs in nursing, addiction studies, medical laboratory uh, science, and kinesiology and sports management. Um, we also have some really rigorous programs in um, the pure sciences. So biology, biomedical engineering, neuroscience. So if you're interested in this, but you wanna be more science. And of course we have a great business school and other things as well. Um, student to faculty ratio of 15 to one, um, and then really small class sizes, one of every two students, one every two classes has less than 20 students in them. Uh, and the health sciences are, are typically on the small end as well. Um, really good student life opportunities and social scene. Um, and we have, we're unique in that we have the highest percentage of college students of any town in America. At like 70% of our town's college students, so it's pretty unique. Um, and then affordability, this is one I really wanted to touch on. Um, our tuition and fees, um, our total cost per year is about $23,000. So that's tuition and fees, your living expenses, books, insurance. We do have merit scholarships available. Um, if you are um, in need of that and you have um, good academics or extracurriculars, things like that, we can definitely try and help you out um, with some scholarship dollars. And then um, um, on-campus employment, I know it's really important for a lot of international students. And 80% of our students that want a job on campus have a job on campus. And with our minimum wage, you can earn about $3,000 a semester just by working part-time. So that's also a good way to help cover some costs. And then lastly, uh, South Dakota is a pretty affordable place. Um, we're number six um, of all the states in the US for low cost of living. And um, so about and relative value of how you can stretch your dollars a lot farther in South Dakota than other, a lot of other places in the United States. So with that, I'm happy to, um, there's my contact information as well. If you want to email me with any questions, WhatsApp, whatever, I'll leave that on the screen for a little bit. Um, follow us on social media, but now I think I'm happy to answer any questions. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much, Patrick, for this wonderful session. And thank you for providing a lot of great resources for students who are interested in getting a degree in the US, especially in um, health science programs. Yeah. So for anyone who's watching us, remember a recorded version of the session will be available on our Facebook page. So we didn't miss anything. And now it's the questions and answers part. Uh, so I'm going to start with the first question that we have received on our Facebook page, and it is from Asma. And um, it is there's another similar question also to the one that Asma asked uh, from another student, Abdul Mohamed. So uh, these students want to get more information about the requirements to be um, accepted into a dental hygiene uh, degree. And Asma wants to know if there are any master's programs in this specific field. So um, dental hygiene. Um... It's kind of similar to nursing um, in that your, your first two years, usually you don't, you, you apply to the university of your choice that offers these programs um, or even community college, you know, it doesn't, you don't have to be at the same university, but what nursing and dental hygiene programs are looking for would be your, not necessarily your grades in high school. They don't really care about that so much. They're looking at of these prerequisite classes of which there's, you know, any, you know, seven to 12 sort of prerequisite classes that you take at the collegiate level. And they want to see how, how did you do in those? So, because not many students are going to be taking biochemistry or they might take anatomy and physiology, but maybe not. So you're going to take those at the um, bac baccalaureate level, post-grad, and then you're going to um, graduate, undergraduate level, sorry. Um, and uh, you're going to use that GPA and then you're applying into the two-year the final two years of nursing or dental hygiene. So for dental hygiene specifically, um, that's really what they're looking for. Um, at my university, it's, I, I don't know as much because unfortunately we only can accept um, US citizens and permanent residents only because we work, one of our clinical sites is at um, a federal facility. But there are a lot of other dental hygiene schools that don't have that you know, weird um, sort of requirement. But, um, so, but they're gonna look forward to that two years of classes at the. Um, bachelor's level in those areas. So they are competitive. So you would want to have above, like, you know, getting A's and mostly A's and some B's. Um, there's no specific entry exam that you need to take or sit for. Um, but they're also then going to look at, you know, your whole profile. So, you know, were you involved in community service or anything like that for the first couple of years? 
when you're on a campus. So, um, and then for master's level programs, you know, not really, um, because as I kind of mentioned, you know, really if you're going on to get a master's degree in that, it's usually you want to go into perhaps a public health field or you want to educate future dental hygienists, but there are master's degrees in sort of dental science and other things really focusing more on kind of the science of, you know, um, dental work um, and why, you know, just the, why do teeth, you know, come through the way they do? Why do they rot? Why do you get infected? Those things like that. So, but that's less of the practice of dental hygiene and more just the test, but hope that answers. Definitely. Thank you so much. Now I have another question about nursing. So someone is asking, is it possible to transfer non-nursing courses from another college or university? Non-nursing or non-nursing? Non-nursing non -nursing courses. So this person wants to study nursing and wants to transfer non-nursing courses. Is it doable or not really? Yeah, I mean, so nurse, I mean, you still have to get a Bachelor of Science in Nursing. And there are classes like at the University of South Dakota, for example, nursing students still have to take a semester of a fine arts class. They still have to do some humanities classes and, um, you know, because so, they're still getting a bachelor's degree in those every U.S. university has a requirement. So, you know, if you are a business student, um, you probably aren't going to get many of those classes to transfer, but you might not have to take the year of math because you've already had it. You know, you won't, won't have to take the intro to rock and roll appreciation because you've already had it. Right. So in some ways, yes, you can transfer those credits if they count to meet other degree requirements. Um, so you so you might only have to focus on, let's say, for example, two years of the free nursing curriculum, you might only have to do one year. So you could save a year of time. Interesting. OK, so we talked a little bit about these scholarships and the financial aid opportunities for international students. So could you please give us like more um, information, or let's say tips on how to secure a scholarship for international students, uh, of course, like what are the requirements to get a scholarship? Sure. Um, so do you want me to speak specifically on USD or just kind of in general? General. Yeah. OK, general. So, you know, universities are first, I think, look at the type of aid. Um, so I think the easiest way to start would be, you know, really know your budget. Um, what can you, you know, what can you afford? Um, and, and when you're doing the budget, include things like your living costs and things like that. So what's my total, what a lot of US universities call the I-20 cost, which is what you'll use to take to go get your visa. So think of like, this is kind of my budget per year. And then look for universities that are going to meet that. Now, if you're one a student where I really need significant amounts of scholarships, um, an institution like my own, you know, we're a state university, we really can't meet that need. So you might have to look at schools that um, have much bigger awards, um, you know, which is kind of hard to find on those, but you can go to their websites or of course work with Education USA and they're going to know those are also very competitive. But then also don't ignore schools that might have only give five to ten thousand dollars a year because if your budget's fifteen thousand or ten thousand, you know, my school, for example, you know, we're at 23,000 cost of attendance. You could, depending on your profile, could get up to eight to $10,000 in scholarships. So it could get you down to that closer to your budget. So that's the first thing to know your budget. Second, um, you know, really look for, you know, that I-20 cost. Don't just look at tuition because somewhere, you know, if it's a school in perhaps, let's say, you know, Chicago, Illinois great city, love Chicago, and they might have a low tuition fee, but Chicago is an expensive place to live. So the tuition fee might be low, but the cost of living is higher. So I think really know the total cost of the school. And then third, since there's over 4,000 schools in the United States, you can't look at 4,000 websites. So I think then kind of go through like what's important to you in looking for a school. You know, it, it helps if you, know, you, if you want to do nursing, for example, not every school is going to have nursing, so that's a little bit easier to sort of narrow it down. But then start getting a list of schools and then looking at their websites to sort of figure out um, scholarships that way. And I think the fifth, fourth or fifth thing, I can't remember how many I'm on, but the last thing I would say is also look at the type of scholarship because there are some universities that have what are called like automatic scholarships that if you have this GPA or above, or if you have this SAT score and above, you're automatically going to get this scholarship. So that's a helpful thing. Like, okay, I know that up front. Others might have a talent scholarship. Maybe you're a you know, play piano or something like that, know those. Um, and then also maybe some are discretionary, like needs-based that you're not going to know until you apply. So I think you have to come to know, understand the different types of aid 
um, because there's some schools that, okay, here's my profile, but they're going to say, yeah, but we need to see what you, how you stack up to the other applicants. So important to have that dialogue with the admissions officer to really understand what types of scholarships are out there as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So for anyone who's watching us, please type your questions. This is your chance to get your questions answered uh, with Patrick or maybe with me. Uh, I have another question, Patrick, from Helmi. So he said, if a student wants to pursue um, an MPH, a master in uh, public health, will he or she be able to change concentration at a future time? Because, you know, there are different concentrations. concentrations. Yeah, I mean, so, so I think there's a couple things I'd like to answer there is, you know, if you have, let's say you have, you're operating currently in a public health um, job or you have a degree in public health or something like that, and you were to go get your MPH, you could definitely switch a concentration and make the argument like, I've been doing this, it's great, but this is where I think maybe more the future is headed, this is more important, or I've been, you really always want to do this area and explain that through your statement of purpose. I, and a lot of, um, graduate programs are going to understand that, and it, it's a fairly common practice. And then once you get the MPH degree, you know, and you chose, let's say, two concentrations or a concentration in more environmental health, and then you want to switch to epidemiology or, you know, more infectious diseases, you know, it's possible, but again, you know, it, um, you know, I think it just depends on then you and your profile. If you're a great environmental health, um, public health individual, and then you want to switch over an employer was probably like, well, you, you pick this up really quickly. We'll do some training on the job or have some other, maybe you take a class or two in this area, you know, on the nights and weekends to get caught up. So yes, I mean, it's, you know, especially in the United States, things are pretty fluid, uh, you know, and jobs, it's not like, well, you, you, you chose this lane and you have to stay in it till you retire. There's all, you know, people change jobs and kind of fields of study all the time. So I think it just comes down to you as an individual. If you're a gifted, um, you know, somebody who works in public health and you're really gifted and talented and you want to switch over, you just kind of have to have a plan and say, this is my plan to do this. And I think um, employers will definitely be open to that. Very helpful. Okay. And one last question uh, from Muhammad. So this student is interested in um, getting involved in the kinesiology program and he's asking about the application process. What does he have to prepare in order to apply? Right. So um, like with most bachelor's degrees in the United States, there's not any specific, um, you, you apply to the university and then you choose a major and you declare a major and you're really not tied. One, you can change your major pretty easily, you know, usually within the first year or two. And there's very rarely do majors have, when you're declaring a major, do you have to show anything beyond I got accepted to the university? So, you know, we don't have, partly because in the United States there's this different system where, you know, those in, um, you know, your K through 12, your, your, you know, our education system, they don't, we don't have tracks, you know, like pretty much at, when you're, your final year of high school, you're pretty much taking the same classes as everybody else in the high school. You know, you might be taking, you know, anatomy while they're taking physics, but pretty much everybody has the same type of field of study. So when they go to the university, you know, there's not like, oh, well, you didn't study anatomy, therefore you can't be a nurse. No, because once you get to the university, you've taken out of it. So um, you don't, if for you to be a kinesiologist or study the, that program, there's really, you really only have to apply into the university, declare that major, and then you start off in that track. So it's actually pretty simple to get into that. Great. Thank you so much, Patrick. Thank you uh, for all of the information that you shared with us today. And thank you for anyone who's watching us. So if you have any specific questions about the majors of the programs that Patrick shared with us today, please reach out to him. Here's his email um, contact uh, on the slide. And if you have any other questions or additional questions related to studying in the US, uh, please get back to me as your advisor and always keep an eye on our face Facebook and Instagram pages. So um, I I know that a lot of students are interested too in studying medicine in the US for that reason. We're hosting a session on medical studies next week, April 7th. So stay tuned, check our events on Facebook and Instagram again. Reach out to us if you have concerns or if you need help and have a good night. Bye, Patrick. All right, thank you, take care. Bye. -bye.